I'm pleased to introduce Ellen Galinsky, who's the president of Families and Work Institute, and I'm very eager to hear about some of the insights she's going to share with us. So without further ado, Ellen. It's a joy to be here with you today. It's my first Close It Summit, and it won't be my last. It's really been so exciting uh, to be here. Um, you will also see um, that I am the Chief Science Officer at the Bezos Family Foundation, and I'm going to be speaking from both uh, from my work at Bezos and at the Families and Work Institute. Um, I'm going to bring a slightly unusual perspective. We've been doing so much talking about skills these days, and um, I look at skills through the workforce and the workplace, but also through cognitive neuroscience. And uh, you heard a little bit of that perspective earlier, but that's what I'm going to share. Ten lessons from developmental research, particularly from cognitive neuroscience, across the lifespan. Um, and the reason that I'm doing that is because we can look at behavior, but unless we go deeper, we can't really understand very much. That's a wonderful quote from Jerry Kagan at Harvard. Um, if we're really going to bring about the kind of change that we think we need, we can't wait till kids are in, um, in, in high school or, or in whatever their secondary education uh, is going to be or post-secondary education. We think at the Bezos Family Foundation that we have to start at the beginning. And the beginning isn't just birth, the beginning is pre-birth because they're intergenerational transmissions of issues like poverty. Um, that can be prevented if uh, with the right kind of interventions, and that's what we're doing now at the foundation. Um, if you, whoop, okay, let me go back. Um, research uh, shows, and this is from Sam Wang at Princeton, um, all of these are taken from videos that uh, we've made at the Bezos Family Foundation, that um, the brain is built like a house being built. It's the foundation for our future learning. Uh, Sam says that about two-thirds of seven trillion connections get formed in five years. It's a constant co construction project, and every interaction we have with a baby or a young child helps shape who that child is going to be. It's never too late, but it's always better to start at the beginning. Um, so you might say, well, we can't start at the beginning. We, we work with older kids, and we've, this is just an example from the kind of thing we've done at the Bezos Family Foundation. Um, we've created a curriculum, uh, thank you, we've created a curriculum to share um, the, uh, the research that we've been now looking at for 19 years, um, uh, looking at the, the emergence of, of, of executive function skills. Um, we have an app uh, that we've created, um, and they're texts too that take a thousand tips for parents. None of these take any more time um, or ask for any money from parents. They're, they're tips that you can use um, in the moments that you have with a child, whether it's feeding or bathing or waiting in line at the supermarket, to build a brain. And uh, we've, uh, using the same principle, working with Mount Sinai Parenting Center, we've created a curriculum that infuses child development knowledge into well-child visits. So um, the early years are foundational in many ways, particularly in the emergence of skills because these, uh, the earliest years are times of enormous brain plasticity. So they're prime times to pr promote executive function skills. So is adolescence. Um, it's a period second only to infancy in the development of, of uh, neural changes. And uh, it gives us an opportunity to promote skills uh, that will help uh, young children flourish. This is a new report from the National Academy of Sciences. I've also been working uh, for the last four years on a book um, on adolescent development. So you'll see some of, of for the forthcoming um, issues that I'm going to touch on. Um, I love the quote from uh, Jennifer Silvers at UCLA, which she says that adolescence is kind of a make it or break it time to begin to learn uh, these important executive function skills. Um, and these are skills that can help us throughout our lives. But as we, as we all know, it's never too late. So um, among the best skills are executive function skills. Um, what are executive function skills? When I first started to use that term, it sounded like some uh, executive bossing you around in your brain, some guy in a pinstripe suit or lady in a pinstripe suit bossing you around in your brain. But that's not what it is. Um, these are the skills that pull together our social, our emotional, and our cognitive capacities so that we can succeed. And studies are showing that they predict uh, success better than IQ tests. 
and not just, uh, ju not just academic success, but health and, and wealth uh, into adulthood. What are they? The three uh, core uh, executive function skills are being able to remember something. This is Clancy Blair's research at NYU. So being able to move those boxes around and remembering which box has the sticker and which box that child has taken a sticker out. Or cognitive flexibility, we talked about that earlier, being able to uh, put big blocks in a big bucket or then move and put big blocks in a little bucket. Um, and wait for that goldfish cracker. It's like the marshmallow test, but here it is with goldfish crackers. Uh, we've also filmed the, the marshmallow test. Uh, how long can that child wait for that, uh, for that goldfish cracker? Um, and uh, these are neurocognitive skills. They're very important. These are skills that, that are very linked to cognitive capacities and are essential for, uh, for goal-directed problem solving. This is Phil Zalazzo's work at the University of Minnesota. So uh, we've talked at the conference about the soft stuff is really the hard stuff. I hope that, that any time you are tempted to say soft skills or non-cognitive skills, you'll think of brain science and never say it again because it's simply not true. The best skills are neurocognitive skills, and we have to understand that they're essential in our life uh, for us to thrive socially, emotionally, cognitively, and in and our health. Um, another fourth lesson is about autonomy, supportive uh, caregiving, and teaching. Uh, they are the predictor, a major predictor of executive function skills. What does that mean? It means that we don't fix problems for kids. We begin to give kids the skills to be able to fix problems for themselves. Really critical. We do way too much fixing things for kids. Um, I did an experiment with teachers once where uh, I asked them about problems that they faced in their classroom, and 95% of them, this wasn't a study, it was just uh, in a speech, but 95% of them fixed the problems for the kids. Um, so we need to learn to step back and, as kids are able, help them fix uh, their own uh, problems, learn the skills to do so, uh, which I think is critical. Uh, so what is autonomy support? It means taking the child's view. It means sharing the reasons why you want something to happen. Ensures that the child plays an active role, joint problem solving. Scaffolding, building on what the child can do, and then removing the scaffold as the child can do more for himself or herself. And encourage uh, by giving helpful hints and suggestions uh, for solutions. Um, the fifth lesson is that learning is active. Uh, I'm going to go now to infancy research. This is in the lab of Patricia Kuhl at the University of Washington. I'm jumping all over the developmental um, landscape here because our research covers all of that. Um, she, uh, you can see the child um, in that top in a, in a machine that looks like a hairdryer from Mars. Uh, that's a MEG machine, M-E-G machine, that enables uh, the, to take a movie of the child's brain in action. And the question that Pat Kuhl had was, how do children learn language? Most people think that children learn language just by hearing it. It's like sticky. You hear it uh, and you absorb it. Uh, that's not true. What she found is, by looking at these uh, 11, 12-month-old children, is that the Broca area of the brain, not just the auditory area of the brain, but the Broca area of the brain, was lit up when children were hearing language. That means that they were rehearsing what they were going to need to do to speak. The brain is not a sponge. The brain is active in learning throughout our lives. So if we assume that we're pouring knowledge into an empty vessel, we've got the wrong uh, analogy for thinking about learning. It's not a sponge. It's not an empty vessel. Um, all learning takes place in relationships. Um, it's really critical, Jack Shonkoff, who uh, uh, headed the Neurons to Neighborhoods Task Force, the National Academy, of uh, science says there is no development, there is no learning without relationships. And that's not true, you know, that's true for big kids, not just little kids. I remember a seventh grader telling me that when he went into the class the first day, he looked at his teacher's eyes, and he could tell from his teacher's eyes whether she liked the kids or not, or he liked the kids or not, and whether the teacher cared about the subject that he or she was teaching. So all relationships takes place in learning. Uh, that's Joe Campos' research there where he shows that um, kids uh, won't venture over that visual cliff, that, that check pattern drops down with plexiglass over it. And unless they see an encouraging smile, they won't cross that barrier. They look to us for signals about whether it's safe to venture out. And in that particular experience by Ed Tronic, 
if the adult makes the still face, which the adult is doing to the child, the child will do anything to try to get the adult to be responsive. It's that back and forth, that give and take through which we learn. And it's not just adults, it's peers. We have, uh, I went looking for, for um, pictures for this presentation when I before I decided to use the photographs from our own experiments that we've filmed, uh, where we've filmed research in action. And they were all, you know, if you take learning in school, they're all the kids, the teacher standing in front and kids holding up their hand. We're missing a huge opportunity for people to learn from each other, not just uh, from adults. Um, the seventh issue is the importance of engaged learning. Um, it means promoting intrinsic motivation. It's not just what we do for rewards. It means promoting intrinsic motivations and helping uh, all of us set goals and strategies. That is the core of executive function skills. It means building on and extending learning um, so that there's that back and forthness that we just, we just saw in those experiments. And it means learning, this is I think important, it means uh, enabling reflection. I haven't heard the word reflection uh, and maybe I've missed it, so if you've said it, I apologize. But um, in this particular experiment by Phil Zalazzo, the child has the task of, you can see that there's a star there, and sometimes you short by color, so put the star uh, in, the, in the box that's red, or sometimes you short by state, put the star where the stars go, and you keep switching. That's cognitive flexibility, working memory, and inhibitory control, all three executive function skills. If you give ch children a chance to step back and think about what, why they've made a mistake, then they, there's actually a neural change. They learn it. Um, if you just say wrong and move on, which is what, again, what I see in most classrooms that I visit, um, the children aren't really learning. If we believe, as the Amazon speaker said, that we have to fail in order to succeed, we need to give people feedback on what, what they're learning and, and uh, how to improve it. Uh, as Adele Diamond says, joy and challenge are better motivators than fear or anxiety. Um, development happens in context. Um, and this is uh, Jennifer, Silver, Jennifer Pfeiffer from the University of Oregon. Um, she says, re she remembers the first time she had a, held a brain in her hand. This was in graduate school and she said, that's it, that's that person. But what she said she didn't realize at that moment is that that's not at all that person. That brain can be completely different in different contexts. Brain development happens in context, so the contexts are critically important. Um, in the Center for the Developing uh, Child, Developing Adolescence, um, they talk about the importance of those contexts, particularly meeting adolescents' developmental needs. They look at acceptance and belonging and admiration and respect. So as I've been writing my book and, and uh, interviewing and reading the best research on adolescent development around the world, I've come up with these eight developmental needs, such as belonging and feeling cared about, or to have autonomy, or to feel supported. In this conference, I have not heard any discussion about the context. We've talked about skills as if they exist in a vacuum, but they don't. And if people, you know, first their basic needs, like are you hungry, uh, have you had enough sleep, but then there are these developmental needs that we need to meet, uh, particularly to have a purpose and contribute as, as uh, we get older, which is, uh, I think, really important. So we're not going to help any of us thrive uh, unless we meet developmental needs. Now I'm going to move to the workforce workplace research um, and say that adults are more likely to fr thrive when their developmental needs are being met. At the Families and Work Institute, beginning in 1992, we did nationally representative studies of a large sample of the U.S. workforce. And we could look at those, uh, you know, 600 uh, questions in light of engagement, uh, health and well-being, turnover, um, and uh, job satisfaction, and marital satisfaction, parenting satisfaction, um, and other sorts of outcomes. And what we found was there are these seven uh, characteristics of an effective workplace that help us all thrive. So I went, wait, when I started doing this research on adolescents, these are the same kind of developmental needs. Adults have very similar developmental needs as children. So to belong, that really pops out. If people don't feel that they belong in a workplace, they don't do as well, they're not as engaged. And we all knew, know that engagement is a proxy for productivity. So meeting needs at every age is important. I hope that from this conference, we won't just pay attention to skills, but we'll pay attention to the context in which skills develop. Uh, the 10th issue is employers are looking for people with life skills and 
that's been said over and over and over again. Um, there's, you know, yet another example of, 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 of what employers are looking for. Um, so let's go to the research now and look at how you promote it. Um, that's a study of Carol Dweck where she's found that if people have a mindset that they can grow and change, they're more likely to be able to take on challenges. I've just picked taking on challenges as one of the developmental needs. Or in this case, if that boy pretends to be Superman, he's more likely to try something hard. He persists for uh, almost a year older level of persistence if he pretends to be someone he admires. In this case, he's chosen Superman. Um, or uh, this is adolescent research. If you take a closer, far perspective, you look at whatever problem you're facing, and you can step back and look at it from a far perspective, you're more likely to handle it. Or finally, in this particular case, uh, Ethan Kroos at the University of Michigan has shown that if you think of yourself in the third per person, you're more likely to be able to take on a challenge. We've talked a lot about adaptability, but I think a critical change is taking on challenges and really teaching that. Um, as Craig Ramey says, we become what we learn. Thank you very much.